Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. And I'd like to welcome you to uh, this session of today. And um, it focuses on presentations uh, from um, uh, four panelists. And um, without wasting much time, uh, I'd like to um, quickly call on our our panelists to introduce themselves and, and do that maybe in two minutes and also give us um, a broad overview of what their presentation focuses on before we go into uh, each of their presentations. So I would like to call on um, Jonathan Ubal, uh, who is an investigative journalist and news editor, to so please kindly come forward and introduce himself. Jonathan? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tomiwa. Hi, hello, everyone. Uh, brilliant session here. I've been following intermittently. And of course, uh, well, from the CHR cohort, a wonderful uh, presentation you gave us last time. And um, I love it. My name is Jonathan Otung Abajim Abdul Hakim Olan Rewaju Akin Timayin Abang Ugbal. Uh, I'm the journalist. I write for an online news portal called Cross River Watch. I'm the news editor there. But, uh, well, I actually had the, I still had the investigation uh, decks uh, while Dublin as the news uh, editor. And um, I will be, my presentation will focus on uh, a story uh, I'm working on, which is uh, what my findings on the digital rights and uh, digital identity management of uh, persons of concerns. We refer to them as refugees most of the time, but uh, well, the UN decided to coin the term persons of concerns uh, from the Cameroonian Ambazonia uh, conflict in four states in Nigeria, Akwaibom, Benue, Cross River, and Taraba states. Thank you so much, um, Jonathan, for that very succinct um, introduction. And next to be Maureen Mwadime, who is a senior human rights officer at the Kenyan National uh, Commission for Human Rights. Uh, um, Maureen? If you're here, you might have to unmute your mic. Hi, Mari. Hello, how are Hi. you? Hello, Hi. everyone. Um, my name is Maureen Mwadime. Um, I'm a human rights officer at the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. Um, I've also been following the presentations I can say they're very informative. I'll be making a presentation today on um, African national human rights institutions and uh, the digital transition. Um, I hope that uh, we will all have we will all find time to engage in the in the topic. So basically, the topic is going to look at the relationship between technology and human rights and related uh, concerns. Um, look briefly into digital rights. Uh, and basically the legislative landscape in this regard, uh, the role of oversight uh, mechanisms with a specific focus on NHRIs, what they do, what they are, and the challenges that they face in discharging their functions, and uh, we'll make proposed uh, solutions to address the um, challenges that we'll highlight. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Mari. And uh, next will be um, Namatirai Ngwasha who is a senior lawyer and legal at, uh, with Legal Resources Foundation in Zimbabwe. Uh, Namatirai, do you want to um, kindly introduce yourself and your presentation in two minutes? Um, good afternoon. Hi, Tomiwa. How are you? Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So like you said, my name is Namatirai Ngwasha. I am a senior lawyer with the Legal Resources Foundation. Um, it's an organization that is into access to justice. So um, I'm going to be doing a pre brief presentation on um, access to justice uh, in, in relation to the courts during the COVID era. So this presentation uh, is, um, you know, from looking at the background of how COVID affected everything, the lockdowns, and yet there were still essential services that needed to be provided like access to the courts. So in this presentation, I'll be looking at how different courts um, adapt 
to enabling people to access the courts and how information technology has played a role and also made contributions to way forward to say how um, governments and the judiciaries can use information technology uh, enabled uh, services to enable access to justice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, right. Next will be Jacqueline Paye Salazar, who's also a lawyer. Uh, Jacqueline, would you like to introduce yourself and your presentation in two minutes? Oh, good afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Paye. I am lawyer. I am Peruvian. Uh, I am studying um, a master degree in human rights in Madrid. Um, my T. FM is about uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence. And for that reason, I'm very happy for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. And so back to Jonathan. And uh, you just um, would like to give us um, issues you may need to identify, for example, in your research so far, uh, uh, now, I mean, you, you would have um, five minutes to um, quickly run through that. Yeah, so after that, I, I, will, I will run through, um, we'll go through the panelists that way, give an overview of your presentation in five minutes. Then after that, we'll, I'll try and ask a question. And also, if the members of the audience have a question, we'll try and take them for any of the panelists. So, yes. Okay, I was asked to prepare a slide, uh, but uh, we're I can uh, share my screen. It's a short slide, actually. Uh, it's fine. It's very... fine. You can go ahead. You can make a presentation. You just have to be five minutes. All right. Okay. Um. Just uh, a moment there, so that I'll be properly guided. Now, like I said, uh, my name is Jonathan Uba. I'm a journalist, and um, I worked. Uh, I'm working actually on the story now. I've uh, concluded most of my few work. What is left to basically is uh, the interview with uh, certain uh, uh, people. But I. I went out into uh, you know, four states in Nigeria, Akwaibom, Benue, uh, Cross River, and Taraba states to look at the digital rights and digital identity management of persons of consent uh, from the Cameroon and Bazonia conflict in South, South and North Central uh, Nigeria, of course. Now, there are some key words that you are going to hear, digital rights, digital identity, persons of consent. Ambazonia being the Anglophone country that uh, uh, what they call um, uh, the English speaking Cameroonians actually want to form. And PRN, which is basically Progress Report Number, uh, House ID, UNHCR, and the rest of that. Now, I would have loved to give a brief history but, uh, about uh, the crisis, but we'll jump that. Now, the four states uh, covered in total uh, in this um, uh, report uh, is over 100,000 uh, square kilometers inside. And, what we saw, what I saw all throughout in, in my findings, I discovered that when it comes to the digital identity management of uh, persons of concern, there is something called the Merge Refugee Status Determination, which is implemented by state emergency management agencies, the United Nations Refugee uh, Agency, that's UNHCR, and the uh, Nigeria Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and Internally Displaced Persons. So they are basically Before then, Nigeria never really had um, any uh, refugee uh, crisis uh, of, uh, like that. But unfortunately, as this happened, uh, the country had to uh, scramble to get into it fits to ensure that, okay, they are able to determine the status of uh, these persons of consent. So uh, a couple of things were done, but at the end of the day, this was what uh, was settled for. Upon arrival, the persons of consent engaged with the Nigerian Immigration Service, uh, uh, who now ask a couple of questions, take uh, certain information from there. There is no uh, tech involved in this. It's just face-to-face. Uh, -face. From then on, the immigration uh, service hands these people over to the state emergency management uh, agencies who will now take some form of uh, data, but this is uh, documented not in tech format, but uh, on paper. They will ask names, uh, uh, you know, your tribe, uh, uh, where uh, in Cameroon you lived, and uh, your uh, age, your date of birth, uh, and a couple of other questions like that. Basically, uh, bio data, but not electronic format. These, they will now forward, they, from there, they will now determine whether you're actually a refugee and then now uh, push you uh, to the National Commission for, uh, for Refugee Migrants and Internally Displaced Persons, as well as the UNHCR, who will now capture 
uh, your data electronically. And uh, the data collected is uh, holistic. Basically, uh, the same data that uh, most national identity uh, you know, commissions uh, have, uh, you know, are collected, like the Huduma number in uh, Kenya, the national identity number in Nigeria, your social security number in the US and all that. So the, it's basically the same information they collect, your date of birth, your uh, parents' name, uh, and if you're married, uh, you know, uh, uh, what they call it, uh, the name you bore before you got married, and if you have relatives living here, and your point of entry, the day you entered uh, uh, Nigeria and what have you. But the, uh, with all of this, the question then now was, who exactly has access to this data? Because uh, when you look at uh, 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 you know, uh, a couple of things that are happening in the, uh, in the world and how data is being mined and sold out to people, and we've seen data breaches left, right, center, this concern was raised. And uh, what I discovered was that the UNHCR and the Nigerian, uh, the NCF uh, RMI, that's the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and Internally Displaced Persons, actually have this data uh, uh, with them. And But now development partners such as um, uh, the Catholic Caritas uh, uh, Foundation, the Justice Development for Peace, uh, Justice Refugee Services, and a couple of other uh, people, including a, a Mediatrics Development Foundation, and what have you, implementing partners for the United Nations, uh, uh, for UNFPA, for UNICEF, and co, they have access to uh, this data as well. So that's, uh, but uh, well, the UN, I, I got to discover that the UN ha actually has uh, some regulation on how they manage uh, uh, this data and the kind of information they give out to the partners. So what happens is for every partner who wants to implement a particular uh, uh, sector, uh, probably you are doing gender-based violence as the case may be, uh, what you collect from the person, the person of concern is their progress report number, uh, which is a unique ID, and it contains every information about uh, uh, that very person of uh, uh, concern. And that is what you file back and give to the uh, UNHCR. Now, uh, Nigeria is, there are a couple of laws in Nigeria that uh, determine that for not for profits, especially, uh, you have to file monthly returns to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. There was no, uh, the uh, development partners were not so eager in uh, uh, telling uh, if they actually do this information because uh, with that, that means there are certain disclosures that have been, uh, uh, will be definitely be uh, carried out and what have you. And aside that the Nigerian Secret Police, the SSS, uh, who self-style themselves as DSS, they always go and ask a question and sometimes demand from uh, caregivers, uh, uh, you know, more details about uh, uh, the refugees and uh, the, the, the cases of exploitation. But uh, moving forward from that, now, the who, who I, I asked if the Cameroonian government was also, uh, I had access to this uh, information and I was told bluntly, uh, bluntly no, but the UN operates in uh, Cameroon as well. So if the information is available with the UNHCR, that means the UNHCR, it's, uh, shouldn't that mean the UNHCR office in Cameroon, we actually likely have that. And um, well, the uh, why we say the, it is all one UN, but that the UNHCR in Cameroon will not share the data with the Cameroonian uh, government. But then, of course, uh, the uh, there are certain controversies that were listed because now with uh, the progress re uh, report uh, number, the PRN, the unique ID given to these uh, persons of concern, it limited a couple of things they could do. In fact, their rights have been infringed upon. We had the issue of, of course, uh, I, you have the rights to identity. And um, uh, for Nigeria, the national identity number NIN is basically the uh, the unique identity of uh, the federal uh, government. Now, when you visit the website of uh, the National Identity uh, uh, Management Commission, you see that even non-Nigerians, once you are in Nigeria and you conduct business in Nigeria or you live in Nigeria, you, you need to have a NIN number. It's something that the, the NIMC has not really uh, sensitized uh, uh, the persons of concerns about, and most of them had no uh, idea about this. And for the few who actually, out of uh, the about 30 people I spoke with, uh, only two actually knew that they could apply for the national identity number, and they have been trying to do that for six months, and they could not. Because when they go and meet um, the... Oh, my time is nearly up. <laughs> now, when they go to meet the NIN officials, they tell them, okay, look, yeah, you, you don't have this. And this limits their access to banking because for you to bank in Nigeria, you need to have a bank verification number. And part of the requirement to get a bank verification number is that you need to have a national identity number. So it limits the kind of transactions they carry up. 
and to access to health for the national health insurance scheme, you need to uh, have this national identity number to assess that, as well as education for those who want to write the joint administration matriculation board examination, the placement examination to universities from high school, they could not register because they don't have uh, NIN numbers. But of course, uh, the other issue uh, in my research was uh, digital rights. Just give me 60 seconds here. And it was basically access to information, access to the internet. And what I discovered was that across the four states, uh, aside uh, in uh, places in the camp at uh, Oguja, the three camps at Oguja, Adagom 1, Adagom 3, and Okende settlement, and most of the places where the persons of concerns reside, they do not have uh, uh, what they call uh, internet penetration, especially in the Kyogen, which is in Adiku, uh, local government area of Benue State. They have no access to, uh, to internet. The only uh, cellular service that's uh, provided there is actually what they get is even below 2G because you can't even uh, do anything uh, with it. There's no data throttling service. So this impact on their access to uh, information, which is a digital right. And at that point in time, when they arrive, they can't even uh, communicate uh, to or get information to know when they are supposed to go get registered or be issued their ID cards, uh, their refugee status ID card uh, in the country. So this were, this, 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 this were some of the issues uh, uh, are discovered uh, and other. I think I will end here since your screen has come up the second time again. I hope uh, maybe the when questions have been asked, I will do more justice to that. Thank you so much for, I see how you're struggling to quickly finish. Thank you for for, for that. We, we, we appreciate it. Um, Maureen, uh, over to you now. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Tomiwa. Um, five minutes is so little for such a big topic, but I'll try to do justice to it. Um, as uh, Tomia said, my name is uh, Maureen Mwadime. Uh, let us jump straight into the topic, uh, which is uh, African National Human Rights Institutions and uh, the digital transition. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, so uh, since the official opening of the expo, we've had different speakers that have managed to establish the relationship um, between human rights and uh, technology. And picking up from earlier presentations, it is worth noting that there is an avalanche of benefits that comes with technology. Both public and private sectors have actually made a radical shift uh, from an analog approach to digitization and provision of their services. Actually, right now in most African countries, uh, the shift is evident in uh, different manifestos. Uh, we have laws, policies, and programs, uh, all that aim uh, to secure such uh, transformation. Uh, this fine to the presentations, uh, I think it is fair for us to appreciate that uh, the digital space is increasingly becoming an important um, enabler of uh, civil and political rights, uh, such as freedom of expression and association, as well as economic, social, and cultural rights, uh, including um, health, education, and social uh, security. Uh, a brief overview of the legislative uh, landscape uh, on digital rights. Uh, the UN Human Rights uh, Council has recognized uh, the applicability of human rights in the digital environment and through its special procedures, resolutions and uh, general comments, they have underscored the state's responsibilities for upholding human rights online. Additionally, uh, policy frameworks such as the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa, which was uh, presented yesterday by Commissioner King, um, also, we have the African Union Declaration on Internet Governance and Development of Africa's Digital Economy, as well as the Malabo Convention, or uh, in full, the Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Prote Protection, all function as regional resources for African governments in the protection of um, digital rights for their uh, citizens. These milestones, uh, notwithstanding, the digital transition has brought with it ethical issues that disrupt the enjoyment of the same rights that we've said it aims to protect and promote. Um, worth mentioning, new technologies do not just inevitably threaten human rights, but the problem of multiple uh, users is particularly acute with them. With them. Now, the digital tools uh, can be used to protect at the same time violate human rights. Um, in an article 
uh, tech for transform transformative change looking beyond disrupt disruption. Kelly Steta, a research analyst at UN Research Institute for Social Development, noted that even seemingly neutral technology can replicate pre-existing inequalities and marginalization. I would love to, um, you know, get into details in terms of um, having uh, examples closer home, but uh, due to time restrictions, please just allow me to proceed. Now, in Africa, the most prevalent uh, human rights concerns arising from digital platforms and use of technological tools include the lack of digital access for all, network disruptions, privacy and data protection uh, concerns, among others. Uh, according to a 2019 uh, report by Collaboration on International ICT Policy in East and Southern Africa, CPESA, 23 African countries have enacted data protection frameworks. This has, however, not stopped several states from embarking on mass personal data collection drives. Um, my colleague has mentioned the Huduma number, which was a drive basically to collect huge uh, um, amounts of data from uh, the Kenyans. And uh, increasingly, the nature of uh, the personal data being collected is expanding to include biometric uh, data. Now, at this juncture, we, we can explore the pivotal role played by oversight mechanisms now that we have appreciated the human rights angle. So uh, what exactly is the role played by oversight mechanism in protection and promotion of digital rights? Uh, we'll narrow it down to NHRIs. So NHRIs, which are natural, national human rights institutions, it's a mouthful, allow me to call it NHRIs, are independent bodies established by law or in the constitution like ourselves, the Kenyan NHRI, to promote and protect human rights in their respective uh, countries. They play a pivotal role uh, to help states meet their human rights obligations under international, regional, and uh, national law. They operate and function independently from government. Uh, they also operate separately from NGOs. Most people confuse NHRIs with NGOs. However, NHRIs should build the constructive relationship between both. Uh, they are a bridge for both. Um, in general, the mandates of NHRIs cover monitoring uh, the human rights situation in countries and the actions of the state, providing advice to the state so that it can meet its human rights commitments, uh, receiving, re receiving complaints, investigating, and also <coughs> resolving uh, concerns or issues relating to human rights. More specific to the topic of the day, the roles of NHRIs in digital spaces was highlighted and detailed in an article by UN uh, Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner to include establishing a human rights based framework for tech in, 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 the, in the tech sector, undertaking um, human rights impact assessments, including assessing human rights risks stemming from the design and deployment of artificial in, uh, uh, intelligence as well as ensuring meaningful involvement of civil society and affected groups in public policy making, so as to reinforce the accountability of state action. Now, these are just but a few roles. Um, you can refer to the article for the whole uh, list. Now, appreciating the role of NHRIs in digital spaces, what exactly is the issue? While most African NHRIs have embraced technology and developed tools to assist them discharge their functions more effectively, their involvement in developing the digital space uh, infrastructure, especially on legal and technical fronts, remain very negligible. As a result of this, the approach by most African NHRIs in safeguarding digital rights has been more reactive, um, which is more or less the protection mandate, uh, as opposed to the proactive uh, approach, which is the promotion mandate. Other challenges hampering the effectiveness of Afri African NHRIs in digital spaces include absence in adequate outdated laws and policies. This has been mentioned over and over again. Lack of oper operationalization of existing laws and policies. So we have the laws, but they're accumulating dust and um, you know nothing much uh, going on in regards to implementation of the law. Lack of independence of NHRIs, lack of technical expertise, and insufficient resource allocation by government. So what exactly are the recommendations? I know that we have delved on the issues. Individual African states need to, among other things, provide appropriate political will to ensure effectiveness of NHRIs. They, the states need to enact and operational law, uh, operationalize the laws and policies that safeguard uh, digital rights. 
um, adequately allocate resources for, N for NHRIs, prioritize continuous training, and enhance capacity development of NHRI staff. After all, uh, an effective NHRI will go to a great extent, uh, we, will um, to a great extent translate to efficient oversight, thereby increasing state actors' uh, respect and protection of digital rights. Lastly, while it might seem a little bit unfair to compare African NHRIs with NHRIs from other parts of the world, including the developed nations, uh, the digital environment presents unique dynamics as violations may occur irrespective of political borders and economic status of a nation or continent. This we have seen over and over again. In this regard, the global and regional communities should strategically co collaborate and partner with African NHRIs to enhance their effectiveness in discharging their promotion and protection mandates as relates to digital rights while ensuring that no one is left behind. Thank you so much for listening and back to you, Tomiwa. Thank you so much, um, uh, Maureen, for, for that um, presentation. I, I think it's a very important um, topic, just like um, Jonathan's. Uh, so far, the conversations have tried to beam uh, such light into most issues that we would ordinarily not um, pay attention to, especially in digital rights um, space. Uh, next, um, um, the panel is Namati Rai. Uh, I'll call on you to please come present your, make a presentation and also please in, in five minutes. Thank you. All right, um, Jamiwa, thank you very much. So um, my presentation, like I said earlier, is on access to justice in the COVID-19 area era. So we, we will note that um, when COVID came last year, 2020, and I think in Africa, it hit, you know, early 2020, and a lot of the countries went into lockdown. And as a result, a lot of operations had to be halted and countries had to find innovative ways um, to operate. So when we then, in, oper in doing the operations, what we have to note is the human rights aspect still had to be upheld and access to justice is a key human right. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. So what then happened, we then look at the issue of the court operations. Some courts um, continued to operate when the lockdowns were announced, but then there were other courts that totally shut out. And the other courts that continued to operate, some were operating with minimal staff, and, but this place staff at risk, which resulted in a lot of um, staff uh, falling sick, and it also resulted in a lot of um, inconsistencies because some of the courts had um, a, uh, an uh, operation whereby people would be coming in on a rotational basis, so you'd have staff coming in for two weeks, two weeks they are away. So then this led to a lot of inconsistencies when it came to handling of cases, and it resulted in some cases getting lost long system and uh, some of the records were also lost. So notably, uh, when the lockdowns were being announced, the chief justices of different countries would then announce practice directions to then say, this is how the courts are going to be operating. So some of these um, practice directions had an effect of even changing court procedures, changing uh, court processes. And it's notable that in most of the courts uh, where the practice directions were coming out, it would be courts were no longer handling cases and it will be only the urgent cases that are being handled. So there's been a lot of argument to say what is an urgent case because going through um, the number of countries that I was reading on, the trend was issues such as bail uh, and first court appearances and maybe issues relating to GBV were then considered to be urgent matters. But then someone might then say, my divorce case is urgent. I, I need to be out of this marriage or I need to, 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 to finish up this um, trial. Because some people, by the time you know the lockdown happened, their trials were already in the middle. Maybe what was left was the pronouncement of judgment and maybe somebody had the potential of being acquitted. Then they end up spending more time in, in custody. So there has been a lot of argument to then say, um, what, how do we really term this issue of urgent? You know, there's need to be 
that uniformity because it's been varying from um, country to country. Um, and really, when we look at the issue of COVID, I think it's going to have long term effects. Uh, like I said, some cases are going to be lost in the system, even the confidence that the public has with the, the, the judiciary. So here in comes ICT and the question would be, so how does ICT enable access to justice? Well, there are some countries that like I'll give an example, South Africa, Rwanda, Nigeria, they had um, a bit of, um, they've got some legislation that enabled ICT to be used in the courts. So as a result, I see their courts did not totally shut down, the courts were operational. So because of COVID, a lot of other courts also had to, you know, change at a faster rate, adapt, because I think what we have realized with COVID, we're going through waves. You know, recently we had another wave and a lot of countries again went into lockdown. So meaning really these courts need to be adapting and taking on these ICT enabled technologies. So some of the technologies that were being used were video conferencing, live broadcast, um, electronic filing, and this enabled you know, people to continue um, accessing the courts. Um, so uh, we are then looked at you know, different countries. Uh, we're looking at um, South Africa. South Africa, when um, the COVID came in, it took quite a number of measures and most of the measures were mainly to combat the spread of COVID and restrict entry into the courts. And South Africa, the South African judiciary, it made use of the case lines, um, uh, the court online evidence management um, application. So through this application, uh, people were able to upload um, their documents and to even do case presentations um, the judges, the magistrates, they could make use of um, the video conferencing uh, for cases, but it had to be by consent. So at least um, there was continuation of um, court work in, in cases like in Botswana was a total shutdown. And um, they introduced a system where the magistrates and the judges would be on a duty and they were also taking the approach of the urgent cases. So now it would be the registrar would be there. We then have the discretion to choose to say what type of a case is urgent. So when such discretion, like I said earlier, there's been a lot of arguments on um, this issue of discretion. Um, Namibia had uh, also some um, ICT enabled uh, methods that it used closed the courts and it was only also the urgent cases that were being held. But at least now they had staff working from home and the staff were working from home were using the court electronic case management system. So they were able to, to, to do the, the document filing and handle cases that were being filed through the electronic case um, management system. So at least um, despite they're not going to work physically, but they were able to work from home. And then when we look at Zimbabwe, um, it also had the same approach of saying the courts were closed and they were only handling the urgent matters. Uh, but then unfortunately for Zimbabwe, there hasn't been much development. Okay, two minutes, all right, I'm almost done. There hasn't been much um, development. So COVID has made the Zimbabwe judiciary actually speed up the development. So currently they are trying to um, speed up and have courts uh, with some ICT and even uh, the next legislation that will then uh, enable the courts to be accessible. Because like I said, the challenge is I don't think COVID is going and uh, going anyway anytime soon. So the courts really need to adapt. Um, and then looking at Rwanda, I, I looked at the Rwandan judiciary they have what they call the Rwandan Integrated Electronic Case Management System. So for Rwanda, there really wasn't much disruption for, for their judiciary because they had this already in place. So the transition was quite easy. Um, so I think um, from this, we then see the importance of ICT when it, when it comes to enabling access to justice to say, it's really playing an important role and the judiciaries need to adapt in either having the physical setups being done, um, even having laws that um, enable the use of ICT because 
with the practice direction, some of the practice directions that were coming into place would say there can be use of um, electronic filing. But then when you go to the court rules, there isn't that provision. So now at times like when the court systems are a bit uh, open and everything, there's now a bit of confusion to say, okay, so do we continue with the electronic filing or now that the lockdown has been eased, we go back. So there is then that need for countries to, you know, put in place laws and these practice directions are, are also in, in, in tandem with the laws of the country. If there's going to be a, a adoption of ICT. Um, but then when we then look at um, if we're to introduce this ICT enabled technology, the bigger picture is now the public because access to justice is there for the public. So I think a key important recommendation is making the public aware uh, that there are these technologies because in some instances uh, the public will not be aware that they, there are these mechanisms that they can use and people will travel. And also I think in Africa one issue that needs to be addressed is the issue of um, internet connectivity and the costs. Um, quite a large number of the population in Africa, they stay in the rural areas. So this affects um, the costs. Okay, Tomiwa. Um, so in brief, I think this is what I'll have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for understanding. Um, Jacqueline, your presentation. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Yes, please go on. Yeah. I talk about artificial intelligence systems that have the ability to acquire, interpret, and analyze data to elaborate judicial decision. An example of the system in the COMPASS program used in some USA states to assess uh, the risks of criminal recidivism or Prometea a system in Argentina that resolve cases of minor infraction, traffic accidents, or social policies, among others. At the present, uh, the, US, the adjusted administration system of the African Union states don't yet have um, artificial intelligence based programs uh, that automatically prepare judicial decisions. However, uh, Africa has taken important steps in the use of artificial intelligence programs that analyze and identify specific information at a level that a um, human couldn't. An example of these programs can be found in Nigeria, where Grace Infotech Limited has created the TIMI system, uh, Tabots, that understand the civil procedure rules of the states of Lagos, also in South Africa, where the Bowman's LP company, which has a geographical distribution in several nations of East and South Africa, such as Kenya, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda, with the collaboration of the law firm Udo and Bilo Osagi, they have a doubt and in an artificial intelligence solution known as Kira, which automatically identified and extracts information for contract. Firms is the first African law firm to adopt artificial intelligence technology. Um, now, it the use of artificial intelligence in the administration of justice advantages. What is the benefits and risk of implementing predictive justice based of the use of artificial intelligence in the administration of justice. Um, advent advantages, greater information and transparency about the functioning of the justice system, 
uniformity in the application of the law and absence of bias that are present in Dutchess, labor saving and reduction of response time, improvement of links between the justice system and the people, improving the level of access to justice, disadvantages, uh, petrification of legal system and jurisprudence, appearance of bias in the algorithms, uh, if the system is fed with erroneous data, then the analysis uh, and the proposed solution that it will offer be incorrect, limited uh, hot link of information, artificial intelligence system don't perceive information that can be obtained through human eyes, the differentless, differentlessness of litigants judicial decision used by automated system are not always motivated but loud and detachment from justice from the concrete case judicial decision aren't always based on logical links a legal syllogism a um, is the is the use artificial intelligence in the system of administration of justice compatible with effective judicial protection? Does the use of artificial intelligence in judicial process violate the rights of defense? That no existence of uh, acute regulations of the use of uh, artificial intelligence violates uh, the right to effective judicial protection. And, um, and for example, a uh, Lumen's case, um, in, in this case, Mr. Eric Loomis was arrested by the Wisconsin State Police and charged with feeling police and using a vehicle without the owner authori uh, authorization. As a result, he was sentenced to six years in prison and five years on probation. The defense defense appealed the sentence, arguing that the rights to due process had been violated because he could not he could not discuss the method used by the Compass software as the algorithm was secret and known only to the company that created. The Supreme Court of the state Wisconsin denied the appeal, arguing that the computer programs has based uh, only on, on, on the usual factor for measure future criminal dangerous, such as fry flight risk and criminal history. Also, the court argued that defended right to do the process and not violate by the only fact that they were unable to ask an explanation of the computer treatment of the algorithm. Okay, two minutes. However, in contrast uh, to the position adopted by Supreme Court of the state of Wisconsin, I believe that uh, any process developed by ad algorithms in the administration of justice has to, to open auditable and traceable and has sent to use blocks black box techniques. This is important to guarantee the rights of defense, effective uh, judicial protection and due process. On the other hand, it's crucial to indicate the responsibility for any human's rights violations and to be attributable the, to human. For this reason, it's important to adopt a regulation governing the use of artificial intelligence in justice administration system. Uh, my conclusion 
uh, else first than use uh, of automatic system for the preparation of judicial decision without uh, uh, adequate uh, regulata uh, regulatory delimitation may not be compatible with our rights to effective judicial protection. We must forget that includes the rights for defense and the rights to do judicial motivation, the, the benefits of artificial intelligence system in the administration of justice are important because that contributes to judicial discongestion and, burn and predictable uh, justice, but this development of the technology at its application in justice must, must be con controlled by humans. For that reason, the regulation is important and in and Georgian uh, national and international regulation are necessary to guarantee that the use of artificial intelligence benefits people without clashing with their human rights that international normative instruments adopted by African Union will be the basis of the normative framework that each member state must adopt according to its legal system, civil law or common law. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, Jacqueline. Um, I think you can stop sharing your screen now. I was actually hoping that we would have more time to take questions across our board uh, because um, the, the, the issues being discussed are quite important, uh, but I think uh, we, we already, we have just 10 minutes left and I don't think that it's super feasible right now. So what I would try to do then rather is to uh, just ask our panelists to give in one minute, uh, try give um, uh, uh, one closing statement with respect to their presentation. And for example, in the case of Jonathan, um, the question might be, you know, uh, the response uh, the statement can cover, for example, what should state or non-state actors do with respect to uh, protecting digital rights of uh, persons of interest uh, in, in Nigeria uh, in the context of the Cameroonian conflict. Um, Jonathan, I don't think you're audible. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How about now? Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay, okay, great. Oh, I had uh, issues with that. Now, uh, the acts uh, from my findings uh, will be that uh, the states, uh, both state and non-state actors, actually uh, need to see access to, uh, you know, uh, what they call telecommunication infrastructure because uh, the mobile phone is uh, about the commonest uh, uh, thing to use to access the internet, right? So we need to look at uh, the uh, telecommunication infrastructure as what is social amenity, just as the, the same way we view housing, water, and uh, of course, uh, food. The reasons being that uh, of the world as we know it has grown and evolved around uh, uh, access to internet. Now, uh, having access to internet gives you the opportunity for a whole lot of things. And um, well, so for just you give me a minute, so I'm trying to rush myself. So for me, it's uh, to ensure that uh, we as a people, the government, public office holders, and as uh, rights defenders push forward to ensure that people see telecommunication infrastructure as a social amenity. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Thank you. Maureen, um, you, you've identified a very key issue with respect to the role of NHRIs, especially in Africa, in you know, promoting and protecting digital rights. What is one key thing that, one major step that needs to be taken by, uh, in order to actualize this, um, this uh, issue, um, I mean, the problem you've highlighted, what is one key thing you feel um, can be done in um, addressing, you know, this um, gap between NHRIs and protecting uh, uh, um, digital rights in Africa. Just one. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Tomiwa. I think um, it will be to underscore uh, the importance of multi-stakeholderism 
in terms of um, uh, policy development uh, in, um, you know, in the digital space, the tech space. More often than not, we find developments happening uh, and uh, NHRI is not being in the picture. Uh, when issues arise, then people will run to the NHRIs basically to seek protection for violation of their rights. So it's very important from the very beginning that we include NHRIs, let them be part of the picture so that we have the holistic uh, aspect of protection of human rights being addressed even as we move forward with the developments uh, in the tech uh, and human rights sector. Thank you so much. Over to you, Tomiwa. Thank you, Marie. Now, Matirai, one, one takeaway, one major takeaway from your presentation. Um, hi, Tomiwa. My major takeaway is, um, despite I don't think COVID going anyway, but I think as a way forward, um, courts, judiciaries need to embrace ICT. It, it makes the service um, efficient, efficient and it cuts on a lot of costs and it enables a lot of access to justice for everyone. So I think ICT just needs to be embraced by um, the courts in their service delivery. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, um Jacqueline, um, one takeaway from um, how courts are supposed to use artificial intelligence, especially within the African context. Just one. Thank you. Um. I, I consider um, uh, that artificial intelligence contributes uh, to this congestion judicial in all countries, um, but it's necessary to establish normative parameter for the application of automatic systems which regulate uh, in which areas of load in which phases of the um, judicial process it's possible to resort uh, to these automatic systems it's necessary to regulate wh uh, what roles this system will play in the process perhaps uh, merely assisting or supporting roles for the judge or uh, decisive roles. In this sense, uh, what will be interventions of the judge? How will the rights to effective judicial protection uh, be guaranteed? And who will assume assumed for any heroes? Uh, that may be made by the automated system. Um, thank you so much, Jacqueline. And um, thank you for to every one of our panelists for their um, wonderful presentations. I personally have learned a lot uh, from each and every one of you, and I hope the audience has also learned uh, a lot too. And um, that will be the end of this session. But uh, after this session, we have a break for... Um, for 10 minutes and after that, uh, no, uh, yeah, for 13 minutes, counting from now, hopefully we finish now. So uh, after that, my colleague, Maricela me, you will be taking other sets of um, presentations from uh, other panelists. So on behalf of um, the panelists, uh, the e, uh, Expression and Information and Digital Rights Unit, uh, the Center for Human Rights, I want to say thank you for joining us for this session and see you at the next one. Bye.
Human Rights cordially invites you to the 2021 Tech for Rights Expo. Join academics, civil society, human rights defenders, state and private sector representatives, artists and many more in exploring how technology influences human rights. Among the themes featured in the Expo include business, education, democratic development, artificial intelligence, children's rights and persons with disabilities. Come and sample the multi-layered and innovative efforts of various stakeholders in using technology for human rights. Be part of this discussion from the 26th of October to the 29th of October 2021. Visit the Centre's website and social media pages to register and to find more information. Let us as stakeholders collectively find ways to leverage digital technologies for the advancement of human rights in Africa. Policy is, a, is an acronym for, that comes from opinion polling and policy making. And uh, the story of policy is that years ago, um, citizens had found a very hard time interacting with governments and in as much as accessing uh, services was concerned. The point of starting this organization was to figure out how to use data more effectively to influence service delivery across African countries. At Policy, we do our research really based on uh, human-centered design. We engage, empower and experiment. Through engagement, we develop digital tools that amplify two-way interaction between citizens and government. Our work focuses on using data and we want people to be part of a bigger discourse because whether we like it or not, data has become a part of our lives and if we are not part of the discussion and if we do not have a seat at the table, then other countries and other corporations will make this safe for us. So it's very important that Whatever we do around data, that we make sure that people in the countries that we work in have a seat at the table to talk about this. And this is really what our work is about. Policy is an organization approaching um, the problems that tech poses to society in a creative and inclusive way. We work with the users so that the research work that we do, the findings that we get, the recommendations that we develop, they resonate with the needs of the user. So we use data and research and digital tools to promote um, and create awareness. But most importantly, we want to craft uh, better life experiences on how citizens, grassroots citizens can interact with data. We have three main pillars of work which are doing data trainings because we want people across Africa to be on the same level as Western countries in how we use, process and protect our data. The second arm is that we do research on data, so looking at data governance, digital rights, anything where data you know, comes in contact with citizens. And the third part that we do is that we build technology products that are based on data, for example, when we do social media monitoring projects. When it comes to impact, I immediately think of our research work. So some of the research that we do has never been done before in an African context. So for example, an issue like online gender-based violence or um, how data is used by feminist movements, these is, this is research that has been done, but not necessarily in an African context. So um, when we do such research, we're visibilizing um, these issues in African context and giving people the data to use for their advocacy. In our past projects, like I'll take for example, uh, Create Your Kampala, which was a civic project that was uh, uh, aimed at empowering citizens to seek better services in their communities. We employed or used uh, data history where we made sure that the data that we, we had collected, we took it back to the people in form of mirrors 
uh, that were painted on walls to make sure that people understand the data that comes from their community. And we, f we feel like uh, such methods of uh, relaying information to the people are the way to go if, if we are going to have a communally or if we are going to have citizens that are actively engaged in policy dialogue. We know that a lot of content that deals with data can be quite filled with jargon or can be quite complicated and you might lose interest of people who should be a part of the conversation. So we are always trying to use creative means to make sure that any of the content that we create can reach people at different spectrums, can meet them where they are, whether that's creating games or creating um, chatbots that are conversational or using artwork, using murals. So I think what really sets us apart is how we combine art and technology to talk about data. At Polyset, we believe in the power of data to revolutionize how uh, governments, pro governments provide uh, services to citizens and uh, we aim to digitally transform uh, services across Africa uh, to craft better life experiences for citizens. In five or ten years, I see policy being an organization that actually comes up with solutions um, informed by the insights that we find from our own research. My vision is to have a company that's headquartered here with subsidiaries in other countries where we get to dictate how the research happens, what kinds of views we take in. And I think that being in Africa, we have a very unique perspective that we can share with the world instead of the other way around. So I think, you know, when we first started off, we were doing work in Uganda, and now we're quite Pan-African, and so the next step is just to go global. Uh, good afternoon. I just want to do a quick check to see whether everyone who is presenting in the afternoon session is here and so that we can just do a mic test. Um, just looking at the, the participants, I see Adipia is here. Uh, hello, how are you? Great. I'm audible. Yes, you're audible. Well, I can just do this now. Okay, Aditi, I think you're audible. Your video looks good. Now, Yazir, I need your help here. How do I pronounce your name? You pronounce correctly, it's Yazir. Yazir. Yeah. And the second name? Yeah, uh, it's Juini, so Yazir Juini. Juini, okay, fine. So I'm going to start with your video. I'm going to play your video and then you can at least give us a background of the video, what you learned from the video, just explain a bit uh, about the video, right? Sure. So I'll start with you, then I will go to Blessing. Blessing, are you here? I can see you're here. Please switch on your mic and uh, your video. Hi. So can you hear me? I can hear you well. How are you, Blessing? Right. I'm fine, thanks, and you. Good, uh, your camera looks fine, your, uh, your audio is also fine. And lastly, I have um, Josephine from Utatuzi. Anyone from Utatuzi Center? Yeah, Josephine from Utatuzi. Okay, how are you, Josephine? Good, good, and you? I'm good. So I will start with um, Yosir, then mm -hmm. I will move to you, Blessing. Um, come to Josephine, the third presenter, and finally I will end with Aditya. Is that fine? Great. So you have 15 minutes to present. We have a very short session, so please keep within the 15 minutes. And then afterwards, I will post questions from the chat box. Uh, if I have any questions, I'll post to you and we'll be done um, hopefully by four. And then we'll have a showcasing of an innovative uh, video by Alternative Digital. I see there's somebody here from Alternative. I'm not sure. Is it Arnold? Please switch on your mic. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Every, good evening. Good afternoon, depending, from, uh, depending on your time zone. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Arnold Mokose Antoine. Mm -hmm. And time to come. I am um, to invite the ED is, is, uh -huh. is with, with us here. So we are fine and ready. Okay, so you'll be the last presentation that we'll have.
after everybody else has presented. All right, no worries, we are ready. Okay, great, thank you very much. So we have a two minute breather and then we can start. Is that fine? Great, see you in two minutes. The Center for Human Rights cordially invites you to the 2021 Tech for Rights Expo. Join academics, civil society, human rights defenders, state and private sector representatives, artists, and many more in exploring how technology influences human rights. Among the themes featured in the expo include business, education, democratic development, artificial intelligence, children's rights, and persons with disabilities. Come and sample the multi-layered and innovative efforts of various stakeholders in using technology for human rights. Be part of this discussion from the 26th of October to the 29th of October 2021. Visit the Center's website and social media pages to register and to find more information. Let us as stakeholders collectively find ways to leverage digital technologies for the advancement of human rights in Africa. Thank you for that. Um, thank you everybody else uh, for joining the afternoon session. Uh, well, we started well. It's, uh, I think we have all engaged with a lot of different ideas around technology and human rights. And I hope at the end of the day, if somebody can say they have not come out learning something, you need to go back and watch the video again because today has been a day of amazing uh, presentations. And now we end on a high note. I know we started with a video that was showcasing uh, an app demonstration by a civil society organization. And so for this last session, we are also going to showcase a video, actually an audio, it's a 15 minute audio documentary that was submitted by Yozir. It's on internet accessibility in Northern African countries where primarily it looks at how the internet was used during the pandemic. And Yozir went out and did interviews with a number of people who she's going to tell us about. But first, let's listen to the video and then I will invite Yozir to tell us more about the background of, of these interviews and where the idea came from and what she learned from these interviews. Yes, so I'm just going to play the video now. Sorry about that. Center for Human Rights. countries in the Maghreb started recording an increasing number of COVID-19 infections, authorities started forcing mobility restrictions going from curfews to lockdowns. For example, we recall the Moroccan authorities first decreeing the lockdown measures on the 20th of March, as the countries are facing the second wave of the spread of the virus since August. Governments continue to go back and forth between enforcing and lifting these measures. 
ما ناس يفقونا تخوص يفقونا يسفرينا بزاف برشا We suffered a lot during the first month as I had to close my business But then I adapted to the situation and went online I used Google services to optimize my online presence for my software and computer reparation business This was Rabia, a local business owner from Algeria He told us how the pandemic's impact was so devastating in the beginning but also how the internet allowed him to provide his services to his clients. This was the case for many business owners, but also for many employees who shifted to remote work through the internet. According to a survey conducted by the job portal Recruit on the working conditions of executives during the lockdown in Morocco, 50% of companies have put more than 80% of their employees on telework. But when we say go remote, shifting from offices to homes, video conferences, spending days if not weeks in lockdowns with the internet as one of the few entertainment means well we are also speaking of skyrocketing demand of connection however unfortunately this demand was not always met with the right offer because of the surprise effect and non-readiness but also because of stagnant old problems that were never addressed but then when COVID-19 started um, we had to ev- evacuate our home countries Uh, I came back to Libya, Tripoli, Libya. At that time, um, Tripoli was going on a, a civil war. Um, the security situation was bad. Uh, it also affected the, the internet and internet, sec- internet situation since uh, electricity was going out for like most of the day, uh, 20 hours a day. Um, I had And it was really tragic to get internet access, internet access at that time. Towers, cell towers are, are dead because there's no electricity. Even the backup batteries are dead because of the long hours of uh, electricity cut. It was very, very challenging for me, honestly. Um, sometimes uh, my internet cuts in the middle of exams, middle of lectures, and I had to beg uh, instructors to understand my situation and everything. This was she had a student at the Lebanese American University who went back to his country, Libya, when the university closed. We asked Jihad about his experience. With distance learning, this is what he told us. I'm starting again uni in two weeks, and this is the third semester that I have to su- uh, survive online. So I've been studying almost a year online. While Jihad's problem was mainly with connectivity, many young kids and local university students got no access to education or in some cases or the provided learning material was way below the expectation officially it went online but then again their online version is not necess- is not really something you could call online because it, w- it just shifted from uh, direct co- courses uh, to whatsapp courses to me my, from my personal opinion i think nothing mm-hmm. really they i mean the the ministry of education didn't really take the time to reflect upon the resources it has and what they can use to reach students. I think what they did was in order for the international community to applaud the Moroccan uh, government, they went online directly and they also created some sort of video content uh, to, to, to broadcast on TVs. But we all know that people from rural areas uh, don't have access to internet nor TV uh, and, and of course At least uh, for those who have access to internet, uh, I mean, uh, uh, learning platforms should have been created that were more interactive and that were more uh, that offered more communication possibilities instead of having uh, a another version of YouTube in front of you. Uh, knowing that actually YouTube offers the uh, comment section to use to communicate while with these services that the government used uh, communication was nearly impossible because no professor is going to stay in front of a video waiting on comments to answer them uh, it's not the same mindset what i could applaud though is there is this digital school in morocco it's called uh, 1337 uh, and they have students that took from their time and volunteered to help the government to create better websites Uh, to host them in better services and to manage the websites because the very first uh, platforms the government created were uh, I don't know uh, the proper word to use but very bad uh, so that I don't use other words 
Uh, and so it was a very nice reaction from these students to take from to take from their time and their energy and use their expertise uh, in service of a larger population. So that's again the issue with these things is that they are they are things uh, coming from communities instead of coming from uh, people in higher positions whose actual job is to do this. This was Ayman from Morocco speaking on e-education in his country. While the shortcomings we spoke of can in a way be related to the uncertainty of these days, the limited resources in some cases, well, the next point has little to do with that. We can't speak about internet connectivity in the Maghreb without addressing the elephant in the room, internet shutdowns. In Algeria and Mauritania, it became an annual habit for authorities to cut down internet totally for national exams. We spoke to the Mauritanian journalist Ahmed Chetou, and this is what he had to say about that. In Mauritania, authorities could shut down the internet for any reason, with no compensation or consideration for citizens' right to access free internet. For example, during baccalaureate exams or national exams, the internet is shut down for mobile users, and the alleged reason is to prevent cheating in exams. So we pay for servers, but we could not have it, because the government failed to stop cheating in exams. Instead of issuing measures to stop cheating, the government sanctioned all citizens. The same thing happened when there is unrest and no apology or compensation for the citizens. Therefore, we are cut down from the world because of the authorities' fears. In the last few minutes, we tried to shed the lights on internet connectivity and its challenges in countries like Morocco, Algeria and Mauritania. We gathered for you testimonies from internet users, journalists, students, civil society activists and business owners. They all gave us a snippet on their internet use when the pandemic hit. Yet, it's important to remember that these people may actually be the privileged ones to continue studying and working online. Many others found themselves disconnected. This was Yusuri Shwini presenting and producing Tawasul, an audio documentary discussing connectivity in times of pandemic. Um. Thank you very much, user, for that. Uh, and thank you for taking the initiative to bring people together to share their experiences um, when about internet access in North Africa. And I think something that has stood out for me in this case is that COVID-19 pandemic forced us to go online so that we can you know, continue with our social life, our political life, our economic life. But then we have all these hurdles that um, your presenters, uh, the, the people you interviewed, your interviewees have talked about. The fact that we are dealing with infrastructure challenges, we are dealing with issues of internet shutdowns, which are limiting our ability to actually embrace this digital world. And so I'd just like you to you know, properly introduce yourself first and then just tell us the idea behind this and what stood out for you uh, from your interviewees. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Jesu Shwini. I am the lead researcher and director of Technoloxia. We are a firm that looks into the intersection between technology, human rights and society and we are based in North Africa. Um, so as you said, the documentary actually, from its name, it's called Tawasol. Tawasol in Arabic means um, communication or a way also connectivity. So the internet pre-COVID-19 pandemic was maybe for many of us a tool of work, et cetera, but for some of us, it's just about connecting to relatives, ones and friends. But when the pandemic hit, many found themselves using the internet as something as vital as, as, as it could be. Um, students need to uh, access their learning platforms, but unfortunately, um, we, felt, we found ourselves not ready for that. Um, in different, you see that uh, in the documentary, people from different countries, we have Morocco, we have Libya, we have Mauritania, spoke about the, the issues they, um, they face. And we found that some of them are maybe related to the pandemic because we had a huge spike in demand, but many others are not. They are something that has been always there or pretty much broken, but it, was, it has been always there. We look into the effect of civil war actually in Libya. We look into the problems of 
connectivity or infrastructure that was not um, maintained properly in Algeria. Um, we look also to the huge elephant, I, I call it a huge elephant in the room when it comes to North Africa, which is internet shutdown, especially today when we hear the disrupting news from Sudan, for example, about the um, network disruptions, etc. So this is a huge problem in the region. And just one more thing is that it also affects vital things like right? education and uh, the right to work and constitutional rights, actually. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think uh, as part of um, just from what your interview is said, I wondered whether there was an element of advocacy here because we saw that this is something that actually disrupted uh, so many lives, so many economies, especially when it comes to continuation of education and, and, and jobs. And so I wondered, were there any advocacy that people talked about to push back against um, these challenges and hurdles that were being put in their place, even by governments? That will have allowed the continuation of their of their lives. Yes. Um, so in the uh, the interviews we, we saw in one in one case it was a business a small business owner that was so much affected by the pandemic and internet was in a way um, the way for him to actually keep uh, economy uh, his economic life like uh, balance it etc and get actually a living. Um, so yes, we moved from a minority of the, or a little bit of some people. Uh, advocating for the right to connect uh, on the internet to actually everyone feeling the need to push um, for a better connectivity, which, uh, which could be holding the, fir the first the telecommunication operators, for example, accountable when it comes to the quality of um, the, uh, the, uh, the network, but also when it comes to um, holding the uh, government accountable in case of internet shutdown. Uh, we saw that now, for example, even in um, contexts that are more oppressive, like uh, Algeria, for example, or Morocco, we are seeing more people actually advocating online to say, okay, it's not just about politics when it comes to internet shutdowns. It actually has an economic cost. It's affecting our everyday life. And if you are using something as simple as a baccalaureate exam, which is the end of the high school exams in, um, in our region, if you're choosing such uh, calls or reasons such to say, okay, I'm cutting down the internet just to avoid cheating, maybe you are not thinking out of the box. Maybe you're, you're using the, uh, something that is easier to do, but it, it has so many costs on the, uh, on the users, on, uh, on the citizen. So we are seeing definitely also more people, actually civil society organizations, um, taking the lead when it comes to e-education. Uh, we saw it in the interview in Morocco, um, where the interviewee spoke, uh, I mean, spoke actually about one initiative that people or students actually in one university said, okay, this platform is not so good, at least the very first one in Morocco, and we can actually do better, and this is how we can do better. So we see that it became, in a way, it's not only about pointing out the problems, but it's also about engaging and trying to m make solutions and uh, advocate more for policy changes, but also advocate for better everyday solutions for all of us. Okay, great. Thank you very much for this. Um, again, as I said, the video will be available uh, on our digital magazine. You can go up, you can go and look at it again and listen again to the interviews that user managed to acquire for this particular documentary. Thank you very much, user. You. And we all can agree that um, Right now, the issue of internet shutdowns is something that we are all discussing. We are all trying to advocate against because we understand the, the implications it has on how we exercise our different human rights. And what's interesting about what Yozir has mentioned, we have always had the justification of public order, protecting national security, which was there. But something interesting about North Africa is the inclusion of um, the, the, the justification of preventing children, or, no, sorry, students from cheating. And you know, we really actually as governments need to move away from punitive measures such as internet shutdowns when it comes to, to, to trying to achieve certain aims and actually look for more human rights oriented um, solutions to these problems. Thank you very much user for that. Thank you. So we can move swiftly to the next uh, presenter. We have Blessing.
Blessing um, submitted an article creatively titled Game of Phones, examining the social media regulatory regimes across Africa. Over to you, Blessing. All right, I'm just going to quickly um, share my screen. All right, so Game of Phones. Um, while I actually haven't really watched the series Game of Thrones, I felt like this was a fitting title for my article simply because in the modern day, we see smartphones being used as a medium for engaging in warfare and in battles um, between different individuals. And my article specifically focused on social media um, as a weapon for this warfare. So, oh, sorry. We see on the slide, there are two different pictures. The first one is the image of a traditional battleground. So here we can see bodies sprung across the field. We see a tank, we see guns, maybe even swords. And this is the picture perfect um, illustration of you know, the traditional battleground. But the battlefield has morphed into something more different. It's moved to the cyberspace. And now warfare is usually fought with things like social media platforms, for example, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. And social media has been argued to be an effective tool for social media warfare. And social media warfare is basically characterized by the um, infusion of advanced technologies into warfare and conflict um, strategies. And you might be wondering, so how does social media serve as an effective tool for warfare? And the answer is pretty simple because with social media, we no longer look at uh, physical attacks. We now look at psychological attacks. We see different um, real world actors such as international organizations, human rights advocates, um, state governments, and even terrorist organizations using social media to basically influence um, perspectives, change beliefs, push ideologies. And even we see the use of social media in running military and um, political campaigns as well as social media movements. And among these movements are uh, the following. I'm sure you're familiar with most of them. There's the South African and my next movement, which basically calls for an end to gender-based violence. We have the um, Hamara genocide, which documented uh, the ethnic discrimination and um, civil unrest in Ethiopia. And we have the common um, NSARS movement, which happened last year in Nigeria. So we see from the previous slide that social media is good for protecting human rights because you can advocate for human rights there and it promotes social and civil justice. But just like a coin, social media also has a flip side where it tends to also violate the human rights that we're seeking to protect. And it is used as a weapon, it's weaponized to basically instigate violence and instability. And so I chose two recent events to sort of draw like a proper illustration of how social media can be used on the two sides. So the first is, as I previously mentioned, the NSARS movement, where we saw social media being used to mobilize and facilitate not only real-time protests, but also like online protests to call for police reform and end to police brutality, and also just to ensure government accountability in Nigeria. And here we see that social media played two key roles. So the first is an organization role in actually carrying out this protest and this call for um, justice. And then the other role is um, its ability to create awareness, so publicity role, because with social media, we're able to, um, the world was able to know about the human rights violations that were occurring in Nigeria. But on the flip side, we have now the Zuma unrest, which happened in South Africa in July. And while this unrest originally started as um, a solidarity movement with uh, the former South African president, Jacob Zuma, who was imprisoned. Um, this uh, protest was basically hijacked by social media and it turned into a series of violent attacks, looting, we saw loss of lives and a significant harm to South Africa's already fragile economy. So just like the NSARS movement, social media was used for the same two key roles, which is the organization of this attacks, the inciting of violence and the publicity. It spread fear and misinformation among people across South Africa. So because of the obvious negative consequences that flow from social media, various state governments are eager to um, hide under the guise of, oh, social media is bad, social media creates 
all these negative effects. Um, they hide under this guise and say they need to regulate social media. So we see regulatory attempts by African states, such as the Nigerian Twitter ban, where um, the government alleged that the reason for the main reason for the Twitter ban was because you know Twitter was being used to undermine the territorial integrity of the Nigerian state. And we see other um, regulatory attempts, such as the Ugandan social media tax, and we have some um, less harmful uh, regulatory attempts, such as you know the South African Cyber Crimes Act. But more recently, like last week, there was the internet shutdown in the Kingdom of Eswatini, where social media um, operators were asked to shut down or restrict the access to social media sites. So we see while the regulatory attempts are necessary because of the harmful effects of social media, these attempts also have the um, capability of causing an infringement of human rights. And this causes a conflict between competing rights. So we have the digital rights of um, citizens, such as their freedom of expression and their access to information on the one hand. And then we have the obligation of the state on international law to protect its national security, its territorial integrity, and stop public order, things like that. And the crux of my article was to determine whether this conflict of interest can be balanced specifically whether um, the regulation of social media under cyberspace in a broader sense by states is legally permissible under international law. And under international human rights law, the more simple answer is yes, because those rights such as you know, freedom of expression and access to information are not absolute rights, meaning that they can be limited in specific circumstances, such as you know, when they're enacted under legis legitimate domestic laws in the interest of protecting national security and the protection of human rights. While this, while we can say, yes, um, <clears throat> the regulation of social media is legally permissible, this does not stop the problem that this regulation causes a conflict of interest, one, and the fact that states can hide under the guise of these regulations to violate human rights and undermine um, democracy. We see this because most often the states are given the broad regulatory powers. So they get to decide, decide what would be national security, what is undermining territorial integrity. And this causes a violation to human rights and democracy in general. We also see that um, the regulation of social media by solely states is inadequate to actually um, combat the neg negative effects of social media. And this is because social media is ever evolving. Technology is always um, advancing. So the regulation by states does not stop the negative effects. At the same time, it's still infringing on human rights. Um, that being said, the way forward is to engage in continuous discussions about social media and technology and its impact on human rights and how we can reach this balance like we're doing now. However, these discussions should not um, exclude the relevant stakeholders, which means that these discussions must include um, the government, the, in the um, human rights advocates, we have to include the big tech companies that actually create the social media platforms. And most importantly, the private um, individuals, like the citizens of the country, must also be involved in this process to reach a holistic um, solution. Additionally, there needs to be the establishment of clear and uniform standards for the regulation of social media and the cyberspace across the continent so that um, we avoid um, the occurrence of punitive laws and the abuse of these um, regulations. And most importantly, because if you have all the standards and there is no independent body to ensure the compliance with the standards for the sake of transparency and oversight, the problem will still exist. So we need an independent body to ensure this compliance. And um, that is it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Blessing, for that wonderful presentation. And um, I know Timothy has put something here on the chat. He says, um, I think he's posted a link here, um, title, we are regulating Nigeria social media to prevent World War III, says Lai Mohammed. So I think it's just one of those things that shows how governments seek to package some of these approaches as a way to protect us. In reality, they are more sinister motives behind their actions. 
And what stood out for me in your presentation is what you brought out in terms of the tension when it comes to these approaches and some of the laws that are there at national level with international law, as well as um, the laws that we have at regional level, which actually call for states to refrain from shutting down the internet, to refrain from some of these regulatory approaches and ensure that they're in line with international laws and standards. And this is an area where we are failing. And I love the, the, the way forward, the recommendations that you put in place um, in terms of bringing a holistic approach to this. And I wonder if you have any comment when it comes to the role of the judiciary. For example, I know in Nigeria, they did approach the regional courts uh, after the Twitter ban, but just generally what's the role of the judiciary when it comes to challenging some of these laws, challenging some of these approaches? Are there reliable judiciaries in Africa or we need to look for other, other approaches or other pushbacks that can dovetail into what you call the holistic approach? Um, I would say that uh, in reality, in, in theory, maybe we can say yes, they are reliable judiciary, but in reality, that's not the case because um, most, well, I guess across the world, but in Africa, we see huge cases of corruption and the judiciary is no longer as independent as it purports to be. And I think therein lies a problem because no one is, there's no transparency, there's no oversight, so no one is being held accountable because there's no independent body. That is true. Um, but it's also encouraging to see, you know, as I said, um, some uh, stakeholders pushing back and actually going, for example, to the regional courts, the ECOWAS court. We know the ECOWAS court also uh, delivered an excellent judgment when Togo had a shutdown where they actually called Togo out and said that they were in violation of international law as well as regional law. So in this case, stakeholders in looking for what you've called a realistic, I mean, a holistic approach, there are different avenues that can be looked at here. Great, thank you very much. Blessing, her full article will be available, as I said, in the digital magazine. Um, Oh, into time now, I see somebody has actually raised their hand here. Timothy, can I give you a minute to make your intervention before I go to the next uh, presenter? You can switch on your microphone and make okay. your intervention. Good afternoon all, can you hear me? Good afternoon, Timothy, we can hear you. Okay, I just wanted to add to Blessing's point or respond to Blessing's um, comments that um, the judiciary, especially in some parts of Africa, Nigeria, for instance, is not really standing up for defense of human rights, sorry, digital rights. Like today, I was reading that the Indian Supreme Court has just uh, intervened in this Pegasus scandal. There's a allegation that Pegasus spyware was used to monitor some journalists and human rights defenders in, uh, defenders in India. And they, a petition was filed and the government came and was brandishing the national security defense that it's a national security issue that if the thing is allowed to be litigated upon, it will not be against, it will be against state secrets and all that. But the Supreme Court said, no, this is a violation. This is a strong uh, allegation of violation of human rights. So a committee has been set up by the Indian courts to look into that petition. But if it were somewhere in Nigeria, maybe, the government will just put up the national defense, uh, national security defense, and that will be the end of the matter. So I think uh, the judiciary in Nigeria and in Africa needs to sit up in defense of uh, digital rights. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timothy, for that intervention. It really goes into calling um, stakeholders like the judiciary to actually play the role that they're supposed to play in protecting the constitution as well as the law. Thank you very much, Timothy, for that. Um, Thank you again, Blessing. I'm just going to move quickly on to the next presenter. We have uh, Josephine from Utatuzi Center. Uh, I know this was a collaborative effort in terms of the article that you, that you delivered, and I hope you're going to at least acknowledge uh, your co-authors as when you introduce yourself and talk about your paper. Just give the title, um, this collaborative co-authored article is titled Attaining Access to Justice Through Sustainable Legal Digital Technologies in Africa. Over to you, Josephine. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, my name is Josephine. I'm a partner at, at Utatuzi Center, and this was co-authored by my co-founders, Muriri Wanyeke, Erastas Njaga, 
And in addition to our team, Nicole LaHoya, who is a PhD researcher uh, in uh, Lucerne University in Switzerland. So allow me to share my screen. So this article came from our personal experiences from starting with Tattoo Center. So just as a backdrop, we started somewhere uh, towards late 2019. So I don't know if it was the universe's intervention or nudge, but then again, I feel we felt that they, there needed to be a change, especially with the delivery of legal services. So, uh, sorry. So when we all talk about access to justice, what comes to mind is the Sustainable Development Goals number 16. And in your mind, as we discuss this, we talk about access to justice, we talk about people-centered justice, we talk about legal assistive technologies, but those terms look so huge, they look so larger than life that when we boil it down to the common monainchi, and especially here in Kenya, we always hear the same phrase, haki yetu, directly translated to our rights, my rights. So what does that mean to me? Um, we're also looking at effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions. And therefore, then again, I want us to think about the social contract theory vis-a-vis -vis the new normal where private institutions are getting into a space which was mandated for government. Government was mandated to take care of justice. Uh, Non-state actors like civil society also came in the mix, but then when you have private institutions dealing with public goods, then the fundamental role starts changing and you start seeing more of a collaborative approach. So my article, or rather our article as Uta to the Center, then covers what affects the access to justice when it comes to digital technology. So Uta to the Center not only provides legal technology for dispute resolution, but it also offers legal technology for virtual legal aid. So then again, from our personal study, we are looking at the interplay between technology and cultural relativism. We're looking at who is the focal point of people-centered justice. We're looking at the design of legal technology, and then last but not least, the realities of implementation. So when we speak about technology and cultural relativism, we need to go back and understand who we are as a society, who we are as a people, who we are as an et ethnic community. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, it was so strange to see everything shut down, not only from justice sector, but pretty much everything just shut down. And it, it took such a nudge for people to, to, to go back and to, and to try and refigure these things. And, the unfortunate thing with law is most of most of the time it comes from a reactionary approach. And here in Kenya, we had seen courts shut down. Um, we had seen services literally shut down. So your cases were either shifted or, you know, uptake of Zoom went up and we're seeing a lot of uh, cases being handled on Zoom. And uh, I, as a practicing lawyer, I also had to, att I attended some of that and you could see the, the challenges of, of, of adaptation of implementation. So then again, we are looking at psychology of dispute resolution. So you've removed me from the physical space where I could be with this person and fight it out vis-a-vis -vis. now I'm already battling my internal feelings of I want this, I want that. And how, how am I now uh, becoming uh, or, or rather getting my rights or getting my services through this, this platform that I'm not understanding? Uh, can you hear me? Can you not hear me? What's going on? Internet drop and, you know, in Kenya, thing, things are unstable. And then again, we had to go around that and really try and assure people who are using our services and, and, and really in the implementation of legal technology to understand that disputes at the heart of it come from a point of breaking of trust. So when you add all these other factors and the general anxiety when it comes to COVID, you're really feeling like this technology could, it, it, has, it has a facilitative effect, but it also sometimes would be like a sword and a shield. So how do you then help people? How then do you provide justice to the public? So, we primarily use alternative dispute resolution, and through that, we it's more facilitative, it's more collaborative, it's more understanding. And 
through our implementation, we've seen trust, adaptability, and compromise is much easier to approach from a point standpoint of technology because then again, trust has been breached. So you must also learn to earn the trust of the person who is already in such a vulnerable position and then also learn to work with them through the process. So the, the, the constant communication, calling. We believe that technology in legal assist, in, 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 to assist legal processes starts from something very simple, just your phone, just an SMS, just a WhatsApp chat. It's so simple because it, it, it now compresses the situation and it makes it more relatable before now you start introducing this larger than life platform that can do this and automate this, so on and so forth. But now we go back to the focal point of people-centered justice. And um, one of our partners, Hill, East Africa, uh, the head, uh, Eric Mwangi, really brought this out in terms of, is justice still just if it's not accessible? And it's such a big thing when we're talking about accessibility, because accessibility is not just about availability. It's also about education. It's also about awareness. It's also about just uh, affordability as well. So, and within all that, it's so, it's so we, can, we can really pinpoint it to a granular level and see that maybe that lady in the village may not access it. Why internet infrastructure, technological infrastructure, technological illiteracy, so on and so forth. So when we're looking at the word accessible it comes in so many different facets and then again accessible from the standpoint of who is it the standpoint of the regulator or is it the standpoint of the end user and in our practical implementation we tend to look at it from the end user so courts are all over at least in every county in, in, in kenya because we do have a county system so what makes it easy for the person at the village level to be able to access the court vis-a-vis -vis access your services through a phone, through a tablet, through the cyber cafe. Uh, how do you uh, ensure matters confidentiality, data protection, uh, user friendly and ease of access as well. So then we try to make our platform and, and I feel our platform, while it is a complete product, it's still an iteration because we keep learning new things. We keep learning, uh, we need probably a chat feature for groups within a dispute resolution session that immediately after just disintegrates and none of us have access to that. Uh, we keep trying to see how we can create mobile, automated mobile telephony for legal aid so that we can have a jockey system. So whichever lawyer is available can be able to handle a legal dispute real time and provide adequate legal uh, uh, attention. Then we've mentioned matters legal design and universal design. And the word universal design is so, I, I personally feel it's so big because universal is big. It, it captures everything and everyone. And sometimes I feel in as much as private sector tries to fit in the role of public sector, then again, where, where are we going? We need, we, need, we need to capture fundamental aspects of the justice process so that we are not only ensuring efficiency, we're also ensuring affordability and we're also ensuring access. So our design and delivery of technological justice solutions has been mapped out in the, tip, in, the, in, the, in the diagram that you see. So if you look at the OECD criteria, they have a very interesting way of mapping it from one side to another. So uh, through our personal uh, experiences on the ground, then now we can see how we go. So we start from need-based assessment. So what's applicable or feasible? So a, a case scenario I could give is we did a legal aid for a minority group in Kenya called the Mukiek. So by the time you get to them, we had to speak to a representative. So how did the representative even get to us for them to now assist? Okay, fine. Then interactive design, simplicity, user-friendly, and availability. So what works and what doesn't? So to someone probably at that kind of a level, 
we would be looking at make it as simple as possible. So can we utilize, so instead of utilizing the whole uh, capability of the platform, can we utilize partial capabilities where they're able to at least receive documents, where they're able to channel their disputes, where they're able to talk to someone real time, as opposed to giving them the entire set, because that then poses uh, an issue when it comes to now interacting with the platform and getting justice and not being frustrated in the same way. Then now we have training and awareness. So before someone even gets to know about the technology, you need to understand what are your rights. And we usually find and we usually get so many calls of people asking general questions, just what do you think about this? How do I start a business? It's not that there's a breach of right, but people are also trying to grapple with what are the rights on the ground before now you tell me about this platform and what it can do for you. So there's a uh, there's a go between with that. And then now monitoring and review. And I feel our monitoring and review should really just revolve around the entire process because every time something happens, we have to go back and forth and back and forth. Then social justice outcomes. So how are the ends of justice being met? So we usually have KPIs in terms of how many women, how many businesses, how many SMEs, uh, what is the cost that was saved during the uh, dispute resolution process? Because we're using alternative dispute resolution, which is relatively cheaper than a formal justice system costs and now the length of time. So is there a cost of meeting the social good? Because then remember, uh, justice in itself as a concept was always put under the purview of the state. So it was always made as free, fair or rather, let me say affordable, because you still have to pay the, some form of administrative fees if you're not then going to use a lawyer, which is a whole other story. But then now when you have the purview of a private enterprise coming into a, an essential public good, then now what is the cost that you're going to, 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 to levy? Because then you have specialists like arbitrators and mediators who need to be paid. You have the infrastructure on the ground, which also needs to be serviced. So how is there the go-between? And then now we look at issues, funding issues, uh, just awareness, global awareness of platforms like this in countries where justice systems are not as swift, are not as techy as what is there in the West. And then we have collaboration and integration. So bridging the gaps to access. Um, one feature of our platform that I'm very proud about at least is the fact that we have assistive devices for uh, persons who have visual impairment. So everything is so simple to access and it's quite easy for them to follow through with the process. But even so inclusiveness includes minority groups, includes women, includes youth. And we have, in, in most African countries, youth are, 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 a, are a group of persons who are really looked down upon uh, and are not as valued. You have also the rights of women. How do they access justice? How do they know their rights? And so on and so forth. So then implement, implementation is really expectation versus reality. And in Kenya, we have this uh, phrase that says in Kiswahili that says for ground between a different. So in literal translation, on the ground things are so, so different. So the, the theoretical niceness versus the practical reality. So this section I'd like to highlight was done by Nicola Hoyer as the PhD researcher. So currently as she is attached to us, she's been on the ground and she's been helping us roll out the project slowly by slowly. Uh, in different areas and also capture the views of people. So this is essentially what she was able to get. Uh, and, and really, it also tallies with what we've been feeling as, 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 as we work through our, our, our thing. So we have infrastructural challenges. So the rate of internet connectivity in Kenya is so expensive. Uh, she, she actually came to our offices and she was like, we can't your, your internet is so much more pricey than it is in the West where she's from and, you know, uh, it is what it is. Uh, we have people not being able to access uh, cyber cafes in some areas, electricity and things like that. Then we have technology literacy and bias. So, and especially we've seen this when it comes to traditional, traditional justice systems. So where you have uh, traditional negotiations, so maybe let's say it's a marriage or a family dispute and you want Baraza, the, 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 the elders to come through and 
then they're looking at it like, uh, even if there's this thing that we can use, we prefer to be right here, right now in the mix. So the technology then becomes more of a hindrance than it does a facilitative point. But then now in Kenya, we have a document called the Alternative Justice Systems Policy that was launched last year. And it's looking to roll out traditional justice systems as a, as a more, let me say, formalized system of justice as opposed to just going to court. So they'd be channeling certain disputes to that uh, area as opposed to people going to court. So then we're looking at technology taking over so many aspects of our life. So that's also a place we will also have to watch and see uh, because the, uh, the justice policy is not yet in implementation right now. So it will be an easy area to watch. Then we have minimal legal education and awareness. And then again, legal education and awareness is also something that hinders people from actually accessing the benefits of the digital technology because the technology can be there but without someone understanding what my rights are and how this technology can help me access my right because the technology essentially is the tool but you must have an understanding of what it is that you want what it is that you need before now the technology proves to be useful to you so what does that mean for us that means that we have to have uh, you know, relatively cheap uh, legal aid services. So currently the Law Society of Kenya is holding a legal aid awareness week at the courts. But if you were to think about it, how many people would want to flood the courts currently? Very few. Uh, people would find it easier to just pick up the phone, ask a, a legal question and be like, uh, what is ABCD? Get an answer and feel at ease. And, you know, institutions like the Law Society of Kenya, um, the judiciary, the what is this the kenya school of law law firms and, and all these people really build up to 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 just increasing legal education and not only legal education just in formal languages like english or kiswahili but also even in mother tongue so we have um one of our partners who worked with us uh in one of our events uh who i idlo which essentially does radio programs in uh, ethnic languages to assist with, um, with, with with legal education. Then the lack of global acknowledgement of legal technology solutions. So you don't want an instance of transposing one to another. You don't want an instance where a solution in let's say Sweden is copy pasted into Kenya. It does not work like that. We have a different set of ways that we do things here. And then the need to fundraise which is something that, you know, needs to propel uh, access to justice solutions, especially digital solutions, because then again, private enterprises are somewhat within a profit, but then you have to strike a balance between profit and social good. So with that comes to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I was just about to intervene, but thank you very much for the presentation and thank you very much for the work that you're doing and for the innovation that you have. You said this was created in 2019 and maybe, you know, you say it's very serendipitous because it came at a time when we were actually being forced to go online. And I hope you're actually already now seeing the impact um, of the technology that you've created. And from your presentation, a quick question, uh, I'll just give you one minute to respond because you've talked about um, this being people-centered. People and I see you've gone, you're just not focusing on urban areas, you've gone to minority communities, you've gone to vulnerable communities, you're looking at disadvantaged groups. But you'd also mentioned something about acceptance in that there's this sort of comfort zone that people have when it comes to in-person dispute resolution. And this is something I think it's a hurdle that needs to be overcome for the success of this particular technology. How are you confronting this particular challenge? Thank you. So the way we choose to confront it is to have to do a lot of community based work. So mm -hmm. talking to people, making people understand, doing demos, even on phones, because the platform is not only accessible on phones, but tablets and making it so relatable to you that the first step of online dispute resolution is just make that phone call, just lodge it. That phone call in itself leads to something more greater and slowly by slowly we walk you through the steps. And we have now like our support services where if you call someone, they take you through the filing, even if they don't, they wouldn't know, we'll see it on the back end once you lodge, but then now someone who can actually walk you through and be like, fill this, do this, press this. And it's relatively simple. So it's just one, two, three step, click and you're through. 
Okay, fine. Please share any links that you have of your organization. If there's a demonstration of this, of this technology, please share it on the chat box and I'll, I'll share it with, the, with all the, the contributors as well as the participants at the end. Thank you very much, um, Josephine, and all the best as you continue you know, launching and improving on this particular technology. Thank you, thank you so much. Great. Um, and to uh, what I'll call our last presenter of the day, though we have one more showcasing that we'll do after Aditya presents. I'm going to welcome Aditya to make his presentation. He, he submitted an article that is quite interesting in the angle that it takes, and it looks at Afrofuturism in the pedagogy of international law. Uh, where he says, you know, he looks at pop culture and rethinking techno-economic approaches to human rights. He also brings in uh, an issue, and I think it's a new idea around fifth generation rights that I will let him expound under this context of Afro Afrofuturism. Over to you, Aditya. Please introduce yourself and move forward with your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Aditya, and I am a researcher associated uh, with Maharashtra National University, Mumbai, India. And I uh, research in the areas of international law and critical legal theory. Uh, so uh, since uh, I delve into a critical legal theory, I am more interested in finding alternatives. And uh, when we talk about alternatives, uh, it's associated with uh, resistance and a resistance to norms that are common, resistance to approaches. So uh, when we talk about resistance to approaches, I find uh, a lot of commonality between these two geographies. Uh, both South Africa and India, because uh, predominantly we have had a very common factor of colonialism and how we approach laws uh, in, in the post-colonial era. So I think we both have been, uh, both, both the nations have been victims of uh, a very bad misadventure by the, uh, by the, by the colonized regimes in, in the past. So, uh, so uh, I, since I'm the last speaker, I have a dual responsibility. Uh, firstly, to uh, speak within the time and to to hand on a high note. So, since I'm an academic, I'm trying to bring in uh, some academic perspective in, into this issue of uh, of uh, techno economic approaches to human rights. How pop culture can play a very important role in how the law and approaches to law develop in the coming few years. So, uh, I begin my paper with uh, begin my uh, blog with a very uh, very confusing uh, paradox that uh, despite Africa's growing political significance, it's under-representation and under-participation in the discourse of uh, international uh, human right lawmaking uh, is really a paradox. So I believe that the absence of a local context and an indigenous approach to law have been bedeviling the culture of academic exploration and research in human right law in third world countries. So I believe when uh, an alternative view is put, fo put forward uh, to the global academic community, May it be an alternative structure in the form of trail or Afrofuturism that I talk about in my blog. It is often faced with resistance and hostility. So this might be a result of a post-colonial leftover that has penetrated the understanding of uh, and uh, the pedagogies of human right law, both in Africa and India. So I, 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 I feel that there is an essence of commonality between do, these two countries. And I have tried to link how India can... Uh, India can move forward uh, in this regime by learning something from Africa and how Africa can try to adopt and acclimate it, itself to the growing problems of uh, cyberspace, nanotechnology, space technologies that are actually restructuring the traditional models of law in the digital era. So I, uh, in my blog, uh, actually travels to this journey of pop culture and how it actually plays an impact on how law is learned and how law is taught and how patterns of teaching models can develop in domestic legal systems uh, when we talk about human rights and uh, other associated rights. So uh, I feel that human right law, uh, the main problem with human right law pedagogy, pedagogy in, uh, in, uh, when we talk about teaching law is the lack of a local context. So these local contexts often comes from indigenous thoughts and these indigenous thoughts face resistance, resistance from universalism. So in this context, I argue that this pessimism about alternative identities like African culture also exposes the hierarchical problems of uh, teaching human right law. So one such alternative identity that actually has the potential to radically transform human right discourse is Afrofuturism. So uh, this trend of Afrofuturism and technoculture became a buzzword in the pop culture movement uh, after, the, after the success of Black Panther. So I, my, my premise of this blog 
is on the idea that pop culture actually matters. It matters for the study, it matters for the practice, it matters for the teaching of international human rights law. So the thing that correlates pop culture and Afrofuturism and human rights law is that human rights law aspires to be global and accessible, while pop culture is global and accessible. Billions of people around the world engage with products of pop culture every day. Billions of people engage with uh, human rights regimes and human rights rules every day. So by discussing popular, popular cultures from an academic perspective, I hope uh, to imagine an alternative of what the world could be, offering many possible alternative visions for human beings, law and justice. So Afrofuturism is not just a contemporary movement, but it is also providing a, lo a local context to the African diaspora. Uh, through the form of art, music, philosophy, uh, and uh, and in various forms of media. So, uh, in in my blog piece, I've argued that while recent advances in the technology have accelerated social developments in the region, and technology has also accelerated development of unprecedented forms of rights, moving ahead of Karl Weizsäcker's three generation rights. So, this developmental shift is what I argue has given rise to the fifth generation of rights of which I feel that governmentality is the crudest test to intervene in the relationship between man and technology. So the very uh, first question that comes up uh, when we talk about fifth generation right is, is that what is fifth generation rights? So I, in, in this blog, have argued that fifth generation of human rights is a product of interlinking of fourth generation, uh, fourth industrial human right, uh, rights along with uh, tech regulated rights. So the fifth generation of human rights is the result of orientation of a disoriented third and fourth generation of human rights. And these rights, when viewed through the prism of third world approaches, that can lead to a new structure of rights known as fifth generation of rights. So these can be described as a techno-economic identity or ideology when we talk about uh, uh, human rights and associated rights that, uh, that interlink technology with how man behaves in a society. So from this perspective, I feel that Afrofuturism can uh, view the present and future of these rights. Because Afrofuturism is an all-inclusive approach with an academic potential, and that can encapsulate aesthetics and future of law with, 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 with reference to science and technology. So uh, since emerging technology is having a very powerful impact on the security and stability of the African states, yet digital revolution's ultimate legacy will, will be determined not by technology, but how it is used. So African countries have the advantage of opportunities and limit the risk inherent in emerging technologies that may achieve greater peace and prosperity. So in, in, my, in my blog, I, I, I try to sense how Afrofuturism can also imagine a dystopic world to come, how contemporary injustice projected into and often intensified in the future. So in, in, my, in my piece, when I talk about a fifth generation of human rights in the African context, I see it as a result of inequality and, op and oppression. And Afrofuturistic notions of uh, real world history and imaginary connect the future and technology with history. Uh, Afrofuturism can be used as a tool to challenge the ideas of laws and its inter intersection with the local context of race, gender, science, and technology. Uh, I, I also believe that Afrofuturism can trickle down uh, non colonialism and, and international law and critical approaches to the way in which digital rights are being thought. As uh, a as fifth generation uh, of rights suffers from the lack of holistic legal attention uh, to its impact, uh, the continent suffers from a social crisis like technophobia or technological illiteracy. So a pedagogical framework can be developed to sensitize the citizenry and to sensitize the system of law. So to tackle the violation of technologically motivated uh, human rights violations, Afro-diasporic culture and aesthetic values have to become a part of legal pedagogy. This, this, there has to be an academic intervention to understand the impact of technologies on human rights. And I argue that Afrofuturism can be an answer to this crisis. So restructuring of pedagogy of reading and researching critical legal studies and international law can evolve the fifth generation of human rights approach as well. So Afrofuturism can solve the crisis of identity in, the, in this uh, debate of fifth generation of rights. This would also accelerate uh, cross-disciplinary discussion about opportunities and challenges of technology. Uh, because it remains a relatively unexplored uh, realm in international law and international relations. So I end up with this very uh, provocative line uh, where I say that Afrofuturism can provide an alternative framework to techno-economic approaches to third worldism and uh, international human rights. And legal education as a tool can be employed as an, 
as as a weapon to revise and re-examine laws from the perspective of science fiction in order to recast the ideas of past, uh, present, and future of the cultural aesthetics of uh, of of Africa. Yeah, so I'll end up with that, and I'll be happy to uh, take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much. I, I don't even know if I have enough time to ask you questions, but it's an interesting topic and it actually goes and aligns very well with the theme of the Tech for Rights Expo in that you're calling us to rethink the way we do certain things. And I wonder in terms of, you do mention in your paper how some of this is rooted on colonial, colonial perspectives, you know. Um, how do we confront the resistance towards adoption of this particular ideology, because the resistance here, if you look at the power structure, we have what we're trying to do in Africa and where the power structures lie, cool, most likely is in the global north. So how do we face or confront the resistance that we can get in adopting this ideology? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful question because I can relate to this very well because uh, we, we share almost a similar experience of how we approach law. So I find a lot of similarity between India as a continent and South Africa as a continent when we approach laws uh, in this post-colonial uh, mindset that we have. So I feel that resistance begins at home. So resistance begins and how you approach the system at the very grassroots level. So I feel resistance or providing an alternative structure can only begin when you provide a structure that is more stronger than the system which Global North tells you that this is this is the uh, this is a structure that you have to adopt how do we how do we resist it by by framing an alternative structure that is stronger in nature and that is more inclusive and that is more egalitarian in sense so that can only happen when you when uh, the system in place is ready to accept the uh, difficulties or lacunas in the existing structure and think about a more inclusive structure that can be used uh, for the future generations all right. Thank you very much. I know we have run out of time, but please share because you did mention that you have a blog. Please share the link to your blog. I yeah. think in addition to your paper, it would be good to actually go to your blog and, you know, engage more with uh, the particular ideas you're putting forward when it comes to this ideology. Thank you very much, Aditya. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Great. Um, uh, we are almost towards the end of this particular session. And to end it off, we have an interesting video that was submitted uh, by a civil society organization in Uganda called Alternative Digitalk. Uh, we were very interested in this particular video because it actually goes and aligns with um, these principles of access, access to you know not only people in urban areas, but access to certain services, access to justice, access to conversations. Uh, to numerous populations, including those who are disadvantaged, vulnerable, and, 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 and minority populations. And Digitalk, I believe, have found a way to reach people, even at their homes, in ensuring that they engage in very important conversations. And so I am going to introduce Arnold from Digitalk. He's going to introduce the director of Digitalk, who is going to give us a bit of a background about the organization, the work that they do, and then we'll play their videos, see what it is that they do and the innovative solution that they have come up with to, to, you know, to do the work that they do. And then we can have a short conversation before we end this day. Over to you, Arnold. Welcome and thank you for being here. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Maestra. Uh, good evening, uh, Pretoria University. It's a pleasure be part of a part and partial of the, the process from inception and we are excited uh, that we are here today. Uh, I am Kose Arnold Anton, the programs director at Alternative League Talk and with me is our executive, executive director Mr. Norman Tumuhimbise uh, is going to give you uh, or to give us the background and then later on we showcase uh, a brief video, uh, then from there, we shall continue uh, with the discussion since uh, we are time bound. Uh, thank you. Uh, back to you, our ED, Norman Tumahimbise. Um, hello, all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this platform, first of all. Uh, Arnold has been doing quite a number of things in regards to this whole thing. 
until today when he was like, okay, it's high time he also brought your face uh, <laughs> for the rest of the team to see you. Thank you all. I hope everyone is doing well and keeping safe and, and uh, healthy. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and it's good to see your face. We have interacted with Arnold when he was introducing us to the work that you do. And now I believe the rest of uh, our participants are eager to see how you do the work that you do. And so I'm just going to share the screen right now. Oh yeah, okay, thank you. Oh, okay, fine. Um, let's... Um, um... <laughs> Get up pretty early to go do something. We are the alternative dig talk. With our mobile studios, we are redefining TV presentation just as technology is setting the best. We are blending our approach with fresh, perspectively designed breakfast show, the mighty drive, informative and entertainment show, exclusive and live interviews. Well, President Museveni, what did you say? I'm going to go to the That's what I call you. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. The alternative dig talk. It was the Kanoka Mighty Drive. Era na ba tu uliza bona abali kumukuto jagala pasaba muge no maso noko uliza. I'll give it to you. Just a click away on your phone, tablet, laptop, and smart TVs. As we are streaming live on our social media platforms, on the road and on the go. We are the alternative dig talk. There you have it. So I think I'll post the question to you. Yeah, uh, this thank is something you. Very Yes, so I think my first question is just to inquire, how did you come up with this idea to have a studio, to have a digital a mobile studio, to go to the people and engage in conversations with the people? What, what, what inspired this particular sort of approach? Anold, are you there? Uh. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, thank you. First of all, um, was misbehaving. I was saying that initially, uh, sometime in 2014, I and another had a peaceful demonstration against the government of Uganda. And this was so symbolic back in the day. And this was 2014, where I and another colleague were at Ugandan parliament to demonstrate against corruption and uh, desertion of young people by the government and their leaders. At the time, we had two yellow piglets and uh, which were symbolic of the corruption and the greed among the Ugandan leaders, in particular parliament and the executive. So later alone, um, the media houses picked interest into our ideas and they would host us to explain and do much more of civic education, in particular about the demonstrations that we used to have at the time. Days and uh, months later, the government uh, gave the media houses instructions that they shouldn't ever host us anymore. 
and every when we would get in touch with the uh, with the TV and radio hosts, they would tell us that the government blacklisted me and others. So they would not ask ever appear on any Ugandan media houses. As a result, uh, I and others also sat down and had to come up with an alternative so that we could host ourselves and also host young people who definitely do not have capacities to pay for such expensive TV and radio shows. But most importantly, there are people, as you will see in our short clip, uh, there are people who are disabled and therefore it would be hard and it remains hard for such people to uh, um, have means to reach the TV or radio stations, uh, people with disabilities, as you will see in our in, in our so brief uh, video clip, then we're like, okay, so how else can we support young people? That's how we came up to innovate such an idea, which studio comes to your home, picks you up, and then drive you as you deliberate, but also heading to your workplace. So to say, it's um, an innovation that first of all comes to serve young people who have no, no resources to secure any, uh, any show on TV and radio, but also to talk about convenience, because if you are to be hosted in it, um, at any TV station, it means you have to wake up in the morning and drive there, deliberate, and then after the show, you go back to workplace, which isn't the case. Here, we host you, we pick you from your home, host you, you deliberate while on the road as you head to workplace or any other place. So there is lots of convenience, uh, mobility, and definitely it's for free of charge, no matter who, it's for free. We have indeed done some good work and been appreciated as you may, if I may refer you to the, the clip that was just played, the, you have watched uh, um, Dr. Stella Nyanzi, one of the leading activists in this country, Uganda, there is some lady who says, I want to thank Alternative TikTok. That's uh, the former leader of opposition in Ugandan parliament, Honorable Winnie Chisa. And she was also a member of, of Pan African uh, parliament, Honorable Winnie Chisa. Uh, the gentleman who says uh, he can feed Mr. Museveni is uh, a right, uh, he's a member of parliament even now, uh, Honorable Medad. Uh, Meda de Segona, he is also in parliament now. So you see that people are appreciating this whole idea and uh, it brings uh, about convenience. It brings about a very wonderful platform uh, for young people to engage and participate because as we all know, young people are addicted for lack of another word. They have positive addiction towards holding their phones. So they can hardly sit home and follow any wonderful debates, but rather, uh, they follow all these discussions on phone. So having realized that, that young people are found on social media, we considered finding and meeting them there for them to discuss and deliberate on issues of national importance. I think in, um, it, I mean, briefly, that's what I can say about this, um, this innovation of the alternative digital. If you may allow, with your with your permission, we could play a, just I think it's over a forty seconds also a video to indeed dig deeper into what we mean when we say we provide space to unheard voices and the vulnerable. Yes, please go ahead. And actually, yeah, what uh, what I have yeah, yeah. to what I'm very impressed with this particular mobile studio is the fact that the inspiration behind it emerged from what we see undemocratic governments, oppressive governments mm. doing. They try to yes. silence certain critical voices. They try to remove you from the public eye, but it only yes. takes a human rights activist such as yourself to look for an alternative platform to say, no, I am not going to be trampled down by, by establishments and I'm going to find an alternative platform, not only for myself, but also for other critical voices that have been denied airtime on, on, on traditional media, on mainstream media. Uh, that really stood out for me. And it's impressive that you actually created an alternative platform for engagement and not just for urban populations, but also for vulnerable groups. That is very impressive. So please do play the video. Is it just checking that? It has not started playing as yet. Yeah, yeah, you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you, but the video is not oh, clear. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, the network was uh, yeah, it's still misbehaving um, here. As you may be aware also, there are lots of concerns with the uh, internet uh, in Uganda. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so to say, that is how the idea was born, that we couldn't stand the suffocation uh, by the regime. So we considered running onto what they do not have control over. And that's how we initiated and invented this idea. I'm trying to, uh, I'm, in, I'm with Arnold, I'm telling him to play our short clip of, uh, I think around 40 or so seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, can you, can you see it and watch it there? Um, it has not started playing as yet. Really? What I can, see, unless you're sharing the wrong screen, because what we can see is the presentation. Oh, oh. Um, let's see. And now? Not as yet. Can we, can, can, I was about to ask if I can send it to you. Uh, you can send it to me though. I think we have run out of time. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, let's yeah. I uh, can I think, share, I can share it. To you and then you can share it uh, later on. Yes, I can. Yeah, but for now, I think being precise, that's what I can say about this. And uh, in, uh, maybe as I conclude, uh, when it comes to our African continent, this very van, as you may have watched, has hosted Pierre Olumumba. And uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, for sure. So which for us, it's a plus that it's, uh, it's being appreciated by even the people you think are of that highest caliber. So that shows the trust they have in this whole innovation. And we pledge nothing less, but to say we shall forever continue with this idea. And by God's grace, we could even have as many as possible so that every region, uh, for, like our country, every region can have its own uh, um, mobile platform because not everyone can uh, find us in the city where we are and where we operate. And also when we are to go up country, we go there once in a while, because as we may be aware, it is kind of costly, but so effective for lack of another word. Great, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I'm just going to give the rest of the contributors one, actually 30 seconds to give us their final word. Uh, so that we can bring this to, to an end. I will now go from backwards. I'll start with Aditya and finish with Yozir. Aditya, 30 seconds, final word. If you make it 15 seconds, even better. Yozir, I think you're ready. Let me start with you. Yeah, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, my final words are simply that we need more uh, studies and research and content actually produced from our countries and uh, from our continent. Um, it's very important to pass the mic, not only to be the voice of other people, but also to pass the mic to, to hear from the people how they are affected by the challenges we face. All right, thank you very much. And thank you for being here. And thank you again for the documentary that you submitted. Aditya? Uh, yeah, uh, thank, uh, like, uh, I, 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 it was, it was actually uh, great to hear so many different perspectives about this issue. I, I really hope that uh, uh, this element of uh, connection of uh, third world approaches and finding alternatives actually find a place when we retell and uh, rewrite stories of how uh, law and technology functions and how it impacts the society. So uh, it was a great, it was great uh, interacting with all of you. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. That's it. Thank you. And thank you for being here. And thank you for your submission. Uh, Joswin, over to you. My thing short would we need to embrace change. We need to accept our own innovations. And we need to move with the times. It is doable. It is on the ground. We just need to pick up the pace. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Great, and thank you for being here. And finally, blessing, final words. Um, I'd first like to say thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this wonderful um, platform. 
I'd also like to say that we should continue to have discussions about the intersection between technology and the law and human rights, such as this. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for everybody for today. I know we are a bit over time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for the engaging discussions. Thank you for your contributions. I have to say this has been an insightful uh, session for me. And since I have read your papers, I do hope everybody else will go read the papers, listen to the documentary more intensely and pay more attention to what you're trying to say and what you're putting ahead, what arguments you're giving ahead, what you're trying to advocate for through technologies that you're using and what arguments you're trying to, to build in this scholarship around technology and human rights. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon, evening, depending on the time zone. All right, bye-bye.